the Godhead, the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there's confirmation in the Scriptures, and I take you to a passage. I'll take you to two passages in the Gospel of John. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. This is a great chapter. Of course, all of John to me is great. I just love the entire book. Every chapter I love. Uh, I love the Gospel of John. Especially love chapters 14 through 17. Just marvelous. Wonderful. Um, here in the 10th chapter, Jesus in this book is going to do seven miracles in the Gospel of John. He's going to give uh, seven messages, one message for each miracle to kind of explain why he's doing what he's doing. And and he's seven times through this book, he's going to say, I am, fill in the blank. And what he's doing is seven is the number of completion. Seven is the number of perfection. And he's uh, perfectly and completely showing us the I am of Exodus 3. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the way and the truth and the life. Okay. In the 10th chapter, he gives us two of the I am's. I am the door and I am the good shepherd. And so he doubles up in a verily, verily of this chapter twice telling who he is. And then he, he says, um, <laughs> verse 24, Then came the Jews round about him and said, Hey, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. If you're the Messiah, you know, let us know. Jesus answered them and said, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. What's he saying? Uh, my father used to tell me this all the time when I was growing up. Son, your actions speak louder than your words. You ever hear that phrase? Actions speak louder than words? He told me that all the time. I was a talker when I was a kid. <laughs> and I used to say things and, you know, he said, more important than what you say is what you do. He says, son, I know you by what you do. Actions are louder than words. Here's what Jesus is saying. Rather than what I've said, look at the works that I've done that my Father's done through me. My actions have spoken louder than my words. Praise the Lord. One of the actions we celebrate this morning, He came out of the tomb. He beat death. Amen. Okay? The only one to beat it, never to die again. He helped some other people to beat it who died again, but He beat it once for all. What a deal. Okay. Verse 26. Even though I do this, but you believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Boy, that's awful. I hope He never says that to anyone in this room. There's a day you'll meet him. And uh, I hope he doesn't say you're not of my sheep. But I don't think that'll happen. Okay, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. And you can underline these three words. I know them. I love that. Not they know me. Because a lot of his sheep, I heard, they don't know all that much about him. But he knows them. And that's the important thing. That's why your salvation is secure and it's eternal. Because you may get Alzheimer's. You may have a spiritual lapses in memory. You may not remember whether you're born again or not, but he knows. <laughs> he knows, and that, that's important. He's got a great memory. I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. <laughs> Amen. This is good stuff. Uh, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Here's the statement number 30. I and my Father are one. So we've been talking about the Godhead for the past few weeks. And here he's just saying, I and my Father are one. And amen. Now that's a deep truth. That's a, a precious truth. That's a truth that's denied from just about everyone on, by everyone on planet earth except believers. Uh, it's a funny thing, you know, uh, Jesus was a great teacher, Jesus was a good man, Jesus was a rabbi, Jesus was a Jew, but he wasn't God. I and my Father are one. That's what he says. I mean, he just said it. I, I was talking to a, a Christian recently that's been witnessing to their spouse and not getting anywhere. And the spouse was saying, well, I believe Jesus was a man, he was a good teacher. And I said, wait a second, you can't believe that. I mean, you can't believe that based on what he said. He just said he's God. I mean, if one of your teachers stood up there and told you he was God, wouldn't you think a little weird of him? Okay. I mean, when somebody says they're God in their own words, there's only three possible conclusions. They're a liar. They're a lunatic. 
or they are God, they're the Lord. Okay, those are the three possible conclusions. But you can't come up with a conclusion, well, he's a good teacher, but he's not God. No, if he's not God, he's either lying to you or he's crazy. So, so just, here he's telling you, I'm, I'm equal with the Father. I am the Father. We're one. Now, later on, in this same book, go to the 14th chapter, which is a great chapter. And later on, he's in the upper room, and now it's the Last Supper, and he's talking to his disciples, and they're alone. It's precious. I love these chapters, 14, 15, 16, 17. In these chapters, Judas is gone, and all that's left is Christ, the ones that he loves, and the ones that love him. So this is a very precious ground to be on. A lot of people liken this to holy ground and actually entering the tabernacle and being with God in the Old Testament. And here he gives a lot of precious truths in this chapter. And one of the things he has to tell the men is the reality that he's going to go to the cross the next day. And, and as he's working his way through this, you know, and explaining to them <laughs> that these things are going to happen, he says, okay, verse 27, So peace I leave with you. My peace... I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I mean, you know this stuff is going to happen in the next few hours. Don't be troubled by it. Don't be afraid. Verse 21, ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Amen. And just stop for a moment. Um, if, if you were near to the hour of your death like Jesus Christ, and here he's near to the hour of his death, and he is thinking about the rejoicing aspect of death in the sense that it brings you close to God. If you're close to the Lord, if you love God and you're near to death, you'll actually be excited about it instead of afraid of it. That's just the truth. Now, if you're not close to God, if you're lost, you can be scared of death. And I've dealt with lots of patients and I've watched the terror in their eyes as they fear because they're not going through the door of John chapter 10. They're going to one of the gates of hell, unfortunately, and they're scared. But when you are close to the Lord, I've been with a few saints that are close to God and they're just rejoicing at the thought of going through the door. Amen. So that'll kind of measure how close you are. But that wasn't my point. That's just... Side. Here's the real key thing I wanted you to see at the end of the verse. Because I said I go unto the Father, watch it, for my Father is greater than I. Now, wait a second. What he just said in the 28th verse of the 14th chapter, and what he said earlier in the 30th verse of the 10th chapter, causes a bit of maybe confusion. Maybe what a a critic would say, ah, there's a contradiction in the Bible. What even those of us who are believers would say, wow, that's a problem text. He just said two different things. He said, I and my Father are one. Now he said, the Father's greater than I. Well, which is it? Which, which, which is it? And some, it's both. So let's take a look at how it is both and see if we can straighten this thing out. And let's see if we can understand how they're one and yet the Father is greater. All right, how are they one? Uh, let's go to beginning Isaiah chapter 44. And we'll try and study through this. There are three aspects in which they're one, and there are three aspects in which the Father is greater. Isn't it interesting God does things in threes? Isaiah chapter 44. I love these chapters too. <laughs> Uh, Isaiah 40 through 48, I, I love these chapters because God himself so much is speaking in the first person and he's speaking a lot about himself. Occasionally he lets the prophet speak, but mostly it's just God talking about himself and being honest about himself, which would almost sound like bragging. But then again, it's all true. <laughs> so anything God says good about himself just happens to be right. And so, so don't be upset. I, I rejoice and I love these chapters. So, so he's going on here and he says, um, verse uh, 6, he says, uh, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, 
I am the first and the last, and beside me there is no God. Um, I mean, who as I shall call and declare it and set an order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. He's saying, look, I have the ability to tell the future. Who else can do that? I can make prophecy. Verse 8, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and, and have declared it? I mean, I told you. Ye are even my witnesses. Watch this. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. I am the first and the last. Beside me there is no God. Is there any other God? Okay, now you've lived on planet Earth. Have you looked around? Have you met anything that would qualify? Not really. He says, okay, well, I've looked over the whole universe. I've looked outside the universe in eternity. I'm it. I'm God. Yeah. That's it. There is no other God. Uh, go to the 48th chapter. Of Isaiah. What, there's an aspect that he has that is uniquely his. And he says in the 48th chapter, in uh, verse 11, about some prophecy that he's made that he's going to make sure it happens for my own sake. Even for my own sake will I do it. I mean, I said something, it's going to happen. How should my name be polluted? If I say something that doesn't come to pass, uh, then I'm just like any other liar. And all men are liars. And uh, we've all been guilty of telling a lie at least once in our life. At least I have. Any other hands? Anyone ever told a lie in their life? Okay. All right. Okay. Now, God, God's incapable of doing that. He cannot lie. He can only tell the truth. And then he says at the end of that 11th verse, And I will not give, here it is, my glory unto another. Jesus and the Father are the same in their glory. That's one of the unique aspects they have. The glory. In the glory of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, their glory is one. It is absolutely identical. John chapter 1. It is the glory of God. It's a glory that is uniquely God's. There's no other creature ever in the history of creation that has a glory that is nigh unto God's. He just said, I checked the whole universe. There isn't anything else. Not Michael the archangel, not Gabriel, not Lucifer before his fall, not any man, no matter how great, not Adam, not anyone. It's my glory and mine alone. And Jesus, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word with a capital W, and the Word with a capital W was with God, and the Word, capital W, was God, verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. And I will not give my glory to another, but this one, I, uh, we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Then their glory and their essence that way, they're, they're, is, they're the same, they're one. The glory of Jesus Christ was the same as the glory of the Father. That's why He could say to Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If, if you've heard me, you've heard the Father. You, you realize you have the opportunity to hear from Jesus Christ on a daily basis? I wonder what God thinks. Here it is. Right here. Here it is. This is from the mind and the heart and the throne of God delivered right to you and me. And the glory is identical. I wonder what God would say to me. This is what He would say to you. I wonder what God's thinking. This is what He's thinking. What a deal. So what do I do? Every day I want to take a look in there. What are you thinking, Lord? What do you want to say to me? That's why I read my Bible. You read your Bible? You want to read your Bible. Most important thing, read your Bible. Most important thing you can do. Most important thing. Uh, food only feed your body. This will feed your soul. Your soul can be eternal. Your body is corruptible. It can die. You better watch it. Your soul can die too. Not yours if you're saved. But people that aren't, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And that soul is not eternal. But 
you have a potential for an eternal soul and eternal life, and it's through this book. And, and they want to partake of this thing. <laughs> At least I do. And it's a blessing. And so you see right there, in terms of the glory, it's the same. There are other passages that uh, discuss... I'll give you another one. Philippians chapter 2. The, the, I and the Father are one. One in what? One in glory. Our glory is identical. Philippians chapter 2. Okay. Verse, end of verse 5, just to show you the subject of what we're dealing with. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. There's the subject who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was in the form of God, equal with God in glory. And it wasn't robbery for him to be equal with God. No, it was robbery when that cherub attempted to be like God back in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. I will be like the Most High. That's not possible. It's not possible for any creature to be like the Most High. But Jesus is in the form of God. By the way, that verse has changed in, in this thing. This is, a, this is something called the NIV. It stands for the Non-Inspired Version. That's what it stands for. It's a book written by men, mo many of them non-believers, some of them very dumb believers, who maybe their heart is right, but their head is all messed up. And they write this book and they make all kinds of errors in it. And that, that verse has changed significantly in here. Again, taking away from the glory of Jesus Christ, which is equal to God. Uh, he says in, in that great final prayer, um, he says, Father, I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with Thee glory, which I had with Thee before the world was. That's John 17, verse 5. So they're one in glory. There's another way that the two of them are one. They're one in their divine nature. Let me show you. Go to Psalm 99, verse 9. Psalm 99, verse 9. There's a nature, an, an aspect, a natural aspect to God. I mean, it's supernatural, but it's, it's part of His nature. You have certain aspects of your nature. I mean, we were born with a natural bent to us. Every one of us. A little different. Some people are mopey. Some people are smiley. Some people are angry. <laughs> Make good Baptists. Uh, <laughs> we're t so, anyways. Uh, okay. Psalm 99. Verse 1. The, uh, the Lord reigneth. Amen. Let the people tremble. <laughs> he sitteth between the cherubims. Amen. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion. He's high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name for, here it is, it is holy. Verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. The nature of the Father is that of holiness. Uh, two key chapters to the book of Isaiah uh, in the first portion in the uh, historical portion, the, the key chapter would be chapter 6. And then when you get to the redemption aspect of the second portion, the key chapter would be 53, which is the middle of the 27 chapters in that portion. But in the sixth chapter, when this prophet has uh, King Uzziah die, and this prophet has grown up under the reign of King Uzziah, who lived, I think he reigned for 52 years, was that correct? I think it's something like that. So that's a long time. And they had a lot of, he was a good king in that he provided the security for the nation. And uh, when he died, like the prophet is, oh my goodness, now what's going to happen to our nation? And when that death occurred, God said, let me give you a greater vision. Verse 1, in that year, uh, the king Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And he says, uh, Isaiah, stop looking at the earthly throne. Look at the heavenly throne. I'll never die. That throne's never unoccupied. I got everything well in hand. Relax. Relax. I've seen recessions. I've seen depressions. I've seen nations come and go. I'm on the throne. What a deal. Who's your king, Christian? Where's your primary citizenship? 
I mean, I have dual citizenship. Did you know that? I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I'm a citizen of heaven. This guy's got three citizenships, right? You've got Colombia, America, and heaven. And if you had to lose two, I can imagine which one you'd lose and the one you'd retain. Our king's on the throne. Okay. Now, he also, when he's on the throne up there, there are seraphims and angels and uh, verse 3, and, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. That holiness is His nature that's connected to His glory. He is holy. That's His nature. His glory is an eternal that one of God and God's alone. His nature is that of holiness. That is our God. Back up to Isaiah chapter 1. I'll show you a word, a, a phrase they use of Him that will be used five times of the Son in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 1. In the fourth verse, He says, Ah, sinful nation, talking about His people, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, like writing books like this. You know, it's real sad one of the days. These poor, deceived, dumb Christians that sat on these committees. And, and I've talked to a man that knew one of the guys that sat on the committee. I haven't gotten to talk to one of the guys on the committee yet. And the guy on the committee was a saved man. Just a dumb Christian. Somebody asked him to be part of the committee. I'll pray about it. You don't need to pray about that. You don't need to, be, to pray about rewriting the Word of God. You know you're not allowed to do it. That word is not supposed to be changed. There's nothing to pray about. There's some things you ought to know a little better than pray about. You ought to know commands from the Word of God. Anyways, this poor, you know, deceived Christian did this. And, and one day he's going to stand before God and find out what he was involved in. Talk about being ashamed. They've, they've, they're corruptors. Children that are corruptors. Uh, and, and then verse 4. They've forsaken the Lord. They have provoked, watch the phrase, the Holy One... Of Israel. Now, in context, he's just called it the Lord. <laughs> capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Tetragrammaton, the word that would be Jehovah in English. That's who the Holy One of Israel is. But when you get to the New Testament, go to Acts chapter 3. The Holy One, capital H, capital O. Five times that phrase will be used about Jesus Christ. Five is a dual number in Scripture. Uh, the greater aspect is the five of grace on the right hand. The lesser is the five of death on the left hand. Thankfully, through his death came the grace. But grace is a beautiful thing, and, and that's what he's full of. And uh, Acts chapter two, or Acts chapter three, and verse uh, uh, fourteen. Now, verse 13, you'll see who he's talking about. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go, but you denied, <laughs> you denied him. That would be Jesus. You denied the Holy One. And that's that phrase, the Holy One. And five times it's used about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again, I and my Father are one. We have the same glory, that of God's. We have the same nature, that of holiness. And he'll be spoken of the Holy One, the Holy Child. He's uh, the Holy Messiah. He is holy. That's our Lord. That's a great uh, attribute of God. That, that's a, a transcendent attribute of God that maybe we don't preach enough on the streets. You know, and it is good to preach that God is love, and He is, and He's loving. But but it, it's good to let people know He's holy. Yeah. I, that's something that's really foreign to us. I mean, you know, we're not holy. I mean, this nation is not holy, but even we individually aren't all that holy, and uh, the church isn't that holy. I mean, and uh, the book is holy. See, and that's good. And God is holy, and He made the book holy. And so when He says. Uh, uh, be ye holy, for I am holy. He's not like giving you a command to be holy because you can't do it, but what he's saying like this, be ye holy, because I am holy, when you interact with my holiness, it'll rub off on you. Like Moses, your face will shine. God will like infuse you with holiness, like those little things kids play with. They got these little toys, 
And I guess you put them under a light for a while, you know, and you just keep it there for a while. And then you take it in a dark room and then all of a sudden it glows. Because all of that was imparted to it. Well, this imparts that light into you and then, it, and then it's part of you. But the, it was given, transferred to you from God. Let me just, so you don't get religious and get tripped up. Holiness is not the way to God. Because you'll run out and try and be holy and it's a counterfeit holy. It's like you going out and trying to be a manufacture fruit. The best you can do is make a, a wax fruit. Nobody likes it. God is the way to holiness. So when you pray and you read your Bible and you get close and you commune with Him, then it rubs off and then it's real fruit, not wax fruit. But here we see, they're one. They're one in their glory. It's God's glory. They're one in their nature. They're holy. Praise the Lord. They're one in another thing too. Go to the third aspect. Go to Psalm 90. So when he says, I and my Father are one, he's telling the truth in terms of their glory and their nature. And another thing, Psalm 90. But he's also telling the truth when he says the Father is greater, and we'll see that in a moment. Psalm 90. This is the psalm written by Moses. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Isn't that nice? The man of God. The man of God. I'd like to be a man of God. Uh, a, a, a man that God is working with, a man that's being molded by God, you know, a man of God. God is doing the work. Amen. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. This is from everlasting to everlasting. The generation of God. See, I'm a member of what they call the baby boom generation. Back there's a member of the World War II generation. Uh, nowadays, I don't know what generation this is. It's one of the last generations. Generations come and go. But in terms of the generation of God, it's eternal. God's generation is eternal. So, so my generation is going to run out pretty soon. The World War II generation is kind of running out little by little by little. There's only few left. Uh, I remember in the 70s, they had the, the now generation. They wanted everything right now. Give it to me now. Okay. Well, I guess God's is the now generation. It's now and forever is His generation. And uh, go to Isaiah 57. So, I and the Father are one. Isaiah 57. That famous 15th verse. For thus saith the High and Lofty One that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. That, that holiness is an eternal holiness. And, and the generation is that of eternity. And, and I can't quite understand eternity. It's, it's hard for me. I can almost partially comprehend it from the standpoint of going like now forward. But when you turn that arrow around and ask me to go now backwards for eternity, I just I can't get it. It's way beyond my mind. Is there anyone that has even a grasp of that concept? Because I'd like to, if you do, please help me. I just can't get that. Somehow God, anyways, forever and ever, backwards and forwards, the mind just can't grasp it. I think that's something that we're going to need our new mind to appreciate it. Uh, I don't want to take too long with this teaching. Now let me go on. We'll talk about it in private sometimes. Okay, uh, go on. Now let me just show you. We've seen that. Eternal, from generation to generation, that's the way it is. Show you what Jesus Christ. Go to Micah chapter 5. To show you that it's the same. I and the Father are one. We are one in glory. It is God's glory. We are one in our nature. It is a holy nature. We are one in our generation. Our generation is eternal. So when Jesus births you, it's eternal. Not temporal. What a deal. 
You know, I've birthed a few kids. It's temporal. They're only going to hang around so long. My father birthed a few. They're only going to hang around so long. When Jesus births you, it's eternal. That generation's forever. Micah chapter 5 of the great uh, prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah. There were two Bethlehems, one up in the north, one in the south. The one in the south was near Ephratah in the land of Judea. So we want to make sure you don't get the wrong Bethlehem. Uh, but thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Jesus' generation is everlasting. It is eternal. Um, and again, we read the one verse, the, the glory I had with thee before the world began, uh, way back in eternity, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, go to First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. So we see the three aspects where I and the Father are one, and he's correct, he's spot on, he's nailed it down. We are one in our glory, that of God's, we're one in our nature, that of holiness, and we're one in our generation, it, our generation is eternal. First uh, Timothy chapter 6, verse uh, 14, uh, and again, the 13th, you know who we're talking about. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Jesus Christ who before punches Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Amen. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. <laughs> whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. The light that comes off of Jesus Christ in His uh, glorified, holy, eternal nature is so bright it would blow your eyes out. I mean, you know you can't look at the sun. I mean, it's so dangerous to look at it. It'll burn your retina. Uh, it's even dangerous to look at during an eclipse. Are you aware of that? During a total solar eclipse. If you were to look at the sun, there's still enough radiation coming that would destroy your retina. And Jesus Christ is brighter than the sun. The sun pales in comparison. Got a great light. So, he says, I and the Father are one. Okay, well if they're one in their glory and their nature and their generation, then how can the Father be greater? Alright, let's go to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, and we'll look at the three aspects in which the Father is greater. Matthew chapter 5. This is a great book. We have a great God. These are great truths. No man could have come up with this stuff. Nothing close to this is out there anywhere. Pick up some of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and the Koran and read that stuff. It's just religious filth. It's bad philosophy. It's cheap. It, there's no science in it. No prophecy. And there are no truths like this. Our God is amazing. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, let's pick it up and let's say verse uh, 45. That ye may be the children of your Father, here we go, which is in heaven. Chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not your arms before men to be seen in them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven heaven. When you pray in the same chapter, verse 9, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. Heaven. The, the Father is greater in location. The Father's in heaven. The Father stays in heaven. The Father doesn't leave heaven. That's stuff He lets the Son do. Mark chapter ten, uh, 2. Mark chapter 2. The Son was on earth. So the Father is greater in location. Mark chapter 2. Why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? <laughs> Verse 10. Mark 2.10. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth. 
to forgive sins. So in location, what you'll see is the Father is greater in that He retained His place in heaven, inhabiting eternity, and He allowed the Son to transcend and be translated downward through space and time into the location on planet Earth. So the Father is greater that way. I'd rather be in heaven than on earth. I don't know about you. Amen. I think heaven is greater than earth. Amen. I mean, it's, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it Being the new Jerusalem and, and what, what God has for us up there. So, so the Father is greater. So there's, there's a truth. I'll tell you another way the Father is greater. Go to, to John chapter 4. Not just in location. John chapter 4. A great chapter where Jesus is giving you a picture of how one could be a soul winner. And he meets this woman at the well. And the woman at the well, you know, starts to dialogue. Well, actually, he begins to dialogue. She just recognizes he's a Jew and then he starts, give me to drink. <laughs> By the way, isn't that precious? That verse, that seventh verse. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. What does he mean? It means give me a drink. But he didn't say it that way. He said, give me to drink. It's a prophecy. It's a pro he knows this woman's going to get saved. And she's going to give him to drink to others. That wording is just almost as precious as uh, Genesis 22.8 in English. Perfectly worded in the King James Bible. Give me to drink. Anyways, it's just some great things you get in the perfect Bible of God's, the old King James. And, and in this chapter, though, uh, she gets a little, let's say, under conviction as the Lord begins to deal with her and, uh, and shows the proper way to give soul winning is to speak about the Lord. And that's what he did. He spoke about himself. I mean, he uplifted himself before this woman. She got under conviction by that uplifting. She tried to defend herself with a little bit of religion at the end. And, and when she tried the religion, Jesus said in verse 21, Woman, believe me, <laughs> the hour cometh when uh, ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And here's the, the precious and wonderful truth that I think you've apprehended in your heart but I want you to get it in your mind is the fact that when you're saved, and I'm saved. Anyone saved? Okay, anybody saved? Okay, when you're saved, a transaction takes place where the spirit of truth now comes inside of you and now you know truth. And, and now you know the answer to the equation 2 plus 2 is 4. And you know it, see? You know truth. It's absolute. It's 4, okay? I mean, spiritually. Well, I'm using it as a spiritual parabolic sense. You absolutely know it. It is knowable. That truth is eternal. It's never going to change. Just like two and two is always going to be four. It was four in the days of the Babylonians. It'll be four a couple thousand years from now. It's going to be the same. Uh, truth is knowable. It's uh, eternal. It's, it's unchanging. And you have that. And, and you ought to know that you know it. And you may not know all the false answers to the equation, but you know the true one. So anytime you're dialoguing with anyone that is not born again, you in utter confidence, standing upon the knowledge of the rock, Jesus Christ and his words, can say very gently, I have to say it sharply, this is something the Lord's been teaching me. The Lord wants to sharpen your sword. Now listen to me. He wants to sharpen your sword, but he wants to soften your spirit. Now, when you're young, you get a sharp sword and a sharp tongue and a sharp spirit. That's no good. He wants to sharpen your sword and soften your spirit. So you can say to someone who is not saved, friend, the religion that you're worshiping really doesn't know what it's talking about. That religion is wrong. Right? Am I correct? Every religion is wrong on planet Earth. Just like he told this lady here. You know not what. You worship, you know not what. You, don't, you really don't know why. Salvation is of the Jews. There's only one correct eternal truth. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. He was a Jewish man. So you know that you know that you know you're right. They're wrong. Now when you're young, you'll have, a, you'll have the sharp sword of knowing you're right and the sharp spirit and you'll cut them up. And I used to do that. Now you'll be much more gentle. 
Well, again, the more you grow with the Lord, a sharper sword, softer spirit. So I don't think he was rough to the woman. He's just being truthful and gentle to let her know. And then he goes on and he says, uh, The hour cometh, and now is, verse 23, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. The Father's looking for worship. He's looking for true worshipers. You need the Spirit. That would be chapter 3. You must be born again. And truth. That would be chapter 17, verse 17. Thy word is truth. You need both to have true worship. That's why, sadly, uh, most churches aren't giving true worship to God. They're born again, but they don't have a King James Bible. That's okay. He'll straighten it out. Remember, I told you the millennium's coming. They're going to get the truth. <laughs> they'll get it straightened out. And after the millennium, they'll worship Him properly. But here's the thing I want to get to. Here we go. God is a spirit. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. Amen. God is a spirit. John chapter 19. Watch the difference. John chapter 19. Verse 5. This is that uh, terrible day of the crucifixion in terms of it was awful how they handled our Savior, although He laid Himself down for our sake. But just thinking it's terrible what He went through. And here they're mocking Him. Verse 5. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. And the Father is greater in His expression in that the Father is expressed as a spirit and only as a spirit and nothing but as a spirit, but the Son expressed as a man. And in that sense, there's no question which is greater, the spirit or the man. I mean, the spirit is the greater of the two. So, so in location, the Father is in heaven, the Son is in the lower location of earth. In expression, the Father is a spirit, and the Son is expressing himself in a humble, humbling himself, taking the form of a man. So in way of expression, the Father is greater than I. And then the third way that you'll see the difference would be in, go to Matthew, back to the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5. And so then we can see how it is. They are both are one, and the Father is greater, and there is no contradiction. It just takes a little study. It just needs to go a little bit deeper. Here's, here's the thing I've observed uh, over the years uh, before I, I became saved. Praise the Lord, what He did for me in 93. But before that time, I was strangely wired. I remember having a conversation with myself in the shower in 1992 that the Lord must have overheard. And uh, I, I had this, this uh, curious bent in me to try and find truth. You know, I didn't know there was spiritual truth, but I was at least trying to find physical, earthly truth. And one of the things I had found in my study of truth is the reality, the truth, that an economic system based on the Bible works, but I didn't know it was based on the Bible. I just knew that that economic system works. I mean, I had read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, probably the greatest economic treatise ever written. And, and that's all biblically based, but I didn't know that. And, and I thought, wow, this is great. You know, I, I got to let people know about this particular truth. That was my desire. But I, when I would try and talk to people and they had a contrary way of thinking, they would often say things that seemed plausible, superficially, but then as you began to examine them, they didn't hold up. In other words, it takes a little depth to understand something. Uh, uh, let me give you a, a comment uh, right now in this situation of this country that we're going on right now. Okay, we're running a deficit, right? We don't want to run a deficit. The deficit means that the government spends more than it takes in. So there's, how do you fix a deficit? If you had one in your house and you were spending more than you took in, there's one of two ways to solve it. One, you make more money, right? Or, or, or you spend less, okay? And you want to get these two numbers equal, okay? So you got this problem in the country. We're spending more than we're taking in. How are we going to fix this? Okay. One would be to cut 
some of the programs, and the other would be to raise the income. Okay. So, if you're a liberal, you never want to cut a program, you want to raise the income. So, the liberal says, hey, the way to do it is we will raise taxes. Does that sound reasonable? Well, it does. It superficially sounds reasonable. Unfortunately, when they raise taxes, they're going to take in less money. Why is that? Why is that? Well, there's a curve. There's a very simple curve that you need to study. All I want to show you is there are things that have a superficial plausibility, but when they're examined, they break down. That's all I want you to do. It takes depth, depth to learn a topic. If you want later on, I'll show you in the basement the equation. Why if they raise taxes, they're going to get less money. But that's not the issue. I just want to show you. You can't think shallowly. God wants to uh, work through our mind. How is he says he wants to renew our minds. And so this issue superficially seems implausible. But it's very plausible when studied. That's all I want to show you. There are things that seem implausible on the surface, but they're fine when studied. There are things that seem plausible on the surface, they're not going to work out. What's it does it take? Study to show thyself approved, or at least talk to someone who has studied and showed himself approved, and, and uh, God, God will tell you whether it's correct or not. Okay, last issue. How is the Father greater? We've seen He's greater in location. He's in heaven rather than on earth. He's a spirit rather than a man. And the last one will be in, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter 5 and verse 34. But I say unto you, people, all these oaths, taken oaths, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. And, and what he wants to show you just briefly what I'm showing you. I showed you back in Isaiah before. He's high and lifted up in the temple, sitting on his throne. In Revelation, there is one sitting on the throne. And what I want to show you is God is on a throne. Amen. He's the king. He's been sitting on a throne as long as I know. He hasn't had to get off his throne. The Father, from eternity to eternity, retained his glory, his nature, his generation, his location, his expression, and his position. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, but I mean sadly, that our Savior had to go through this is in John chapter 19 and verse 23. Then the soldiers took Jesus and they crucified Him. And the Son had to take a position on a cross and get down off His throne and humble Himself all the way. The Son had to take a position not just on a cross, but in a, in a grave. So, now we look and we say, okay, I and the Father are one. The glory, that of God's, we see it's the same. Isaiah 44, John 1. The nature of holiness, it's the same. Isaiah 1 and Acts 3. The generation, it's eternal. Psalm 90 and Micah 5. Eternally, they're one. But, the Father is greater in location when the Son was on earth, in expression when the Son was a man, and in position, particularly when the Son was on that cross, temporally. And so, it all depends on whether you're looking at them from outside of time or inside of time. It's, it's just that simple. It's uh, from the time of zero... A.D., let's say, to 33 A.D., the Son had humbled Himself and taken a position lower down where the Father was greater. But eternally, they're one. What a blessing. What, what a God. What a God. All right, we're done with that lesson. Any questions or thoughts on what we just studied? It's just a simple Bible study. All right, let's thank, thank the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for helping us to clear up what didn't seem reconcilable, but with study it, it became very easy to understand that from eternity to eternity, everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God, Thou art glorious, and Thou art holy. And that uh, because of the, the love inside of Thee, Thou wast willing to humble Thyself, take the fashion of a man, become a servant, and die on a cross, so that we might have life. And on this day, we celebrate greatly the fact that 
you came out of that tomb and are risen, and we will be celebrating that the next hour. I pray you'll be with us, Lord, and, and bless us and, and help us to just rejoice in our salvation. Give us the joy of our salvation that we may help others to come to thee. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.